<laughs> you are two trucks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dad. All righty. Um, yeah, any other testimonies or praises you'd like to share today? Well, I definitely have a praise. It's so nice to be with you all. Uh, so, Tabitha, it's so nice to have you. And, yeah. and Karen, good. I'm so good, grateful that you joined us. And it's good to see all of you here again. And uh, Christian, my man, you know, look at him. I mean, look at him. What, seven? <laughs> seven. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I tell you, you know, is it I know. <laughs> we gotta have so, a tally board. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we gotta start doing. Have a tally for every every person here. You know, how many weeks can you go? You made but, ten uh, weeks in a row. You get a free cup of coffee. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, and uh, we need some attendance badges. Yeah, have attendance badges. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, I know I have a. Uh, I have a testimony for, or a praise for uh, a week ago, um, we, or almost a week ago, we had a choir cantata, Christmas cantata, uh, at Prospect, it was really good. Amen, right? <laughs> Amen. Justin and I were testifying, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyhow, we had a really good Christmas cantata, uh, really enjoyed it, I enjoyed having uh my dad and Daniel both helping out uh, with the music there, so that was pretty awesome. And uh, but anyhow, are there any other praises or uh, testimonies? I don't have a praise, but I'll put in a plug for my Baptist church. They're gonna have their cantata harmony. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. She showed up at our Christmas cantata and was handing out cards uh, for their <laughs> cantata. I said, I said, you know what? <laughs> I'm willing to admit it's a good idea. I'm going to go around our church and do it too. <laughs> but, uh, you might be trying to proselytize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's funny today, you know, talking about Baptists, because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about in the sermon today. We're talking about the birth of the Baptists. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> the first one. The first one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, anyhow, uh, anyone else have a phrase or a testimony? All right, well, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much that we can be together. Lord, it's such a, it's such a welcoming environment here. Lord, it's a small group, but Lord, your presence is mighty. Uh, your spirit is huge. Uh, Lord, your power is immense. It's so amazing. And Lord, we just... Uh, we come together today, we come every Saturday uh, to, to encounter you, encounter you through the people here, encounter you through the Word, encounter you through worship. Uh, Lord, it's such a blessing to be in your house. And I, I believe, Lord, that uh, it's not the fact that we're in a physical building, it's the fact that we are in a presence, we are with each other, we're not forsaking the gathering of ourselves. Lord, uh, as last week as we talked about it, we don't want to cut out parts of the Word. Uh, we want to, to uh, be the scribes. We want to be the preserving agents of God's Word. And so, Lord, uh, I pray that you challenge us and you continue to move us to, uh, to stay together, be in unity, uh, love you, and to learn from your Word and, and decide as, as a group that we're not going to cut out any of the Word. We're going we're gonna to live by it. In fact, we're going to be such good examples of it that the world's going to see it through us. And so, Lord, I just pray your anointing over this service today as we worship, as we, as we celebrate the, the coming of the Messiah into the world. Uh, Lord, it's so amazing when we really take a moment and to think about it, talk about it. Uh, Lord, that, uh, that your will, your might is, is so alive, is so well, and is there every day. Lord, I just thank you so much uh, for what you've given, all the blessings of my life. Um, Lord, I thank you so much that you allow us to be a part of your redemptive story. Uh, Lord, that the story is not, was not over uh, 2,000 years ago. In fact, it really began. And so, uh, God, I just thank you so much. I praise you for the fact that we have the opportunity uh, to be uh, an anointed one from the Most High. Uh, and that is that we are anointed with the message and we're anointed with the good news. So, Lord, I just pray you bless this service. Anoint it with your spirit. Teach us and guide us. Show us what we need to know. Um, Lord, I just thank you for the testimonies and the praises, Lord. I know for me, it was such a joy to be able to walk today and have my bachelor's degree. Um, so that's so nice, Lord. And um, 
God, I just praise you, Lord. A couple years ago, um, you know, I remember spending time with many people here today, and I didn't know what my next steps were, but God, you did. You were in control. You were in charge. And so I praise you for how you direct the paths, Lord. Uh, help us um, yield to you and trust you uh, in all that we say and do. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together and join in singing uh, our first song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We got a little bit of an interesting version here. You'll uh, you'll learn it.
Who wrote the hymn Harp the Herald Angels Sing? Does anyone know that? Charles Wesley? Yeah. Charles Wesley, yeah, that's right. And you know, Charles Wesley, the Wesley brothers, you know, they were a big part. And the, in fact, they were the prime uh, parts of the Methodist movement. And uh, what's interesting about it is they were focused, their biggest priority was evangelism for the lost. That was how Methodism was so, it was big about Bible study. If you could get a Bible in somebody's hands, if you could get them just to study it for themselves, the Lord would call them unto salvation. And so I just think it's so amazing. I think about how, uh, you know, how they had the passion to go out and they were able to tell other people about it. And I think it's so cool that with that song, you know, you're saying, Lord, come down. King of heaven, come now. For so many of us, we tend to treat it like it's way out in the distance. But no, God is here today. And we say, Lord, come now. Come down. Uh, today as we're worshiping, we're praying that He comes in this place, that He impacts us deeply in our hearts. And so today we're going to continue singing. It came upon a midnight clear. Another interesting version here, but it really is uh, very beautiful.
God bless you. Praise the Lord. We're going to take our prayer requests at this time. So if you have any requests or praises, I always open up praises both times. But if you have um, any prayer requests or praises, you can go ahead and share them at this time. Oh, wow. He's really sore, and he's got a lot of water retention. Okay. But he says he's feeling so much better. He That's good. Praise the Lord. Glad to, glad to hear Carter's doing well. And Carter, if you're watching, God bless you. We're praying for you, man. <clears throat> um, yes, Tracy. Uh, my sister Sarah. Yes. She had hip replacement surgery Wednesday, and then she came home on Thursday, so... She's doing good. That's good. That's a phrase for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Bill Roberts down there used to run the store where the packing house yes. is. Yes. He's in intensive care now and strong with some kind of bad infection. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look good for him. They did put a drain in one of his lungs. Both of his lungs. And one of them helped. And he's on the ventilator, too. But he has some improvement. But she, his wife really. Okay. We're going to pray for, for Bill. <coughs> certainly. Certainly, certainly. Charles, I was talking to you earlier, and I'll share this. Um, this has not been a good week for me. Um, some of you know I've been substitute teaching on a long-term basis at Andrew Jackson High School. And I had about six students and family coming tomorrow to help with worship, congregational music. They were going to play as well, and do some things on their own. Well, due to unforeseen circumstances and things beyond my control, they're not going to be there. And, uh, and some other things were going on, which I'm not free to disclose or to talk about those things. But I've just felt a lot of spiritual oppression this week. And it's true. It happens for pastors, and it happens for all of us. But um, the devil is after us, folks. I mean, this world is a cruel place and a rough place, and he doesn't want us witnessing. He doesn't want us trying to influence people for Christ. And so I felt some of that oppression this week. And I've, I've come home from school, and it's been, a, it's been a rough week and things going on. And so I just ask you to pray for that situation, to pray for me and knowing how to handle things and what I should say, what I shouldn't say. So, um, I don't want to submit to Satan. That's right. I submit to God because I'm a child of the King. Amen. And so, that's my testimony. But sometimes we are limited in the things that we can do. And so, we, we have to be subjected to certain people and powers and things that are going on. And so, it's just been a rough week. And so... Just remember that. Remember all of us uh, you know, in this time of the year, especially. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. I remember Brooklyn. She's running a fever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn. With a fever. Don't you know, pray for my niece, Sarah. Okay. She's going through a tough time. One of her cats had surgery yesterday to remove one of its legs. So she was able to cat cut home today. It's moving around a little bit, but it's going to be in recovery. And she takes her pets very seriously. She, she gets upset when she sees a dead possum on something. Right? Oh, okay. But she's that type of yeah. animal person, animal lover. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll pray for her. Sarah. What's her name? Any other prayer requests? Uh, pray for Dean. And her name is Dean? Dean. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Got it. Got it. All right. Anyone else? Charles, I got a, I got a family that's kind of um, dear to my heart in, in, in ways and uh, new, some new people that I know. And they, they need us to pray for, for forgiveness. A lot, of, a lot of people are losing out. You know, on love and and support and companionship and 
because they can't they can't find forgiveness in their heart to move on you know to forgive people of things that you know we're like sometimes our families become like the Hatfields and McCoys we, we've <laughs> argued so long we forgot what we started arguing about and, and but we but we do know there's something there to be mad about and so um, I, I, I just know some people that need the Lord to to, uh, to let them experience forgiveness and be able to forgive and so that they can receive forgiveness because I believe the Lord taught us you know when he taught us how to pray he, he taught us to forgive you know to ask for forgiveness the way we we forgive others but if we don't forgive others then maybe we haven't really realized what we're asking God to do for us and so um, we families are you know are hurting so much today there's so many families out there hurting because they're they're carrying things in their in their little bag of grumbles um, <laughs> that they won't let go of. And so uh, these people I have in mind are, are, uh, could use the Lord's touch as, as many of us could. There are many of us walking around with that on our backs today. Definitely. Yeah. So I have another slide. Okay. Unspoken. <laughs> If during this prayer time, if you can think about me, I'm uh, looking forward. It's funny, um, I, every, I can see that the message tonight was definitely meant for tonight, but I am a little worn out. So, so I'm praying that the Lord can, can communicate the, the message tonight. Um, I stayed up uh, doing my last assignment for the semester uh, for my master's program that uh, I started back in August because I officially finished my bachelor's in August and then I started right then and there on my master's program. Um, but I officially walked today at 10 a.m. or 10.30, you know, it took a while before I started walking. But um, so anyway, I stayed up till about 2.30 last night. <laughs> and then I woke up again about, about 5.30 or so or 6. So I'm operating off a little, but I think there's a really good message tonight. But I just don't know if the messenger will be as good. So if you if you pray for me uh, as we're doing our prayer time. But is there anyone else though that has a prayer request or a praise you'd like to share? All right, then let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we come to you today humbly with our arms open, with our hands out wide. Lord, we are, Lord, we're we're coming to you, God. We we believe that you are. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is in control, the faithful, the, the authority. Lord, we believe in the victory. But Lord, sometimes it's difficult to see it whenever we're, we're so close to the problems in front of us. And so Lord, I just pray for your freedom. I pray for your restoration and for your healing. Uh, for whatever might be going on in the personal lives today, uh, whatever uh, there might be in our families or in our friendships or in, in our works and in all these different things that we do, Lord, may we have freedom, may we have abundance, may we have restoration and freedom, God. I pray this. Uh, Lord, I, I lift these things at your feet. All the requests that were shared today, there are people who are hurting, sincerely. There are people who may not make it. There are people today who are struggling who are, are, are really doubting their worth. There are people today who are struggling in the sense of, of what they are called to do or what it's supposed to be. There are many people that are, are dealing with uh, spiritual warfare. And Lord, today we boldly and triumphantly lay it at your feet. We, we, we have the confidence... Lord, I pray for the confidence. I pray for the confidence that we are going in into the battle with the utmost confidence that we will win. That same type of confidence, we humble ourselves and we lay these things at your feet. We lay them at your feet. We give them to you. So, Lord, I just pray your will be done. And so, God, I pray that, that, that the, the presence of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of you, Lord, come down to this place and counter us deeply. <clears throat> Lord, I pray... Uh, for the request, and I give you praise for how you're going to work these things out, how you're going to draw more people to repentance, and how you're going to draw more people to be in your church. So you're going to draw more people to know you. And Lord, I'm going to steal something that I heard earlier today, but to know you, but to make you known. So Lord, I pray that we can do this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. All right, let's all stand together and join in singing our next song, Make Room. Until we have a drought. Mm -hmm. It can need right. to be so much we have a flood. Yep. But in the book of John, Jesus has the woman at the well. 
and he makes reference to the living water. Well, where do we get living water? How can I make this living water? If I ask Doug or Charles to bless this, would it be living water? Only if my faith is strong enough to make it living water. Charles blesses it. And I know once you ask God for something, if you believe it in your heart, it is. That can be transformed into holy water in faith. But our offering is faith too. And is the reason you offer to a church or to a program or anything is because you either believe in it or it's just something you're doing to make whatever statement you're looking at. But believing in it, that's what faith is all about. So let us know that. And I don't want to run Charles long tonight. So. You know, <laughs> he was talking earlier about the messenger. So, you know, give him a little bit of time. Let's bow our heads if we will. Heavenly Father, it is with great joy and great love that we come before you. We take an offering at the back, Lord, as, as it is willing. And we thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. But Lord, above all, this season of Advent, and this being the weekend, the Sunday of joy, is our show. The joy of the shepherds when they found the newborn king. Let that reenactment in our hearts make joy in us, because it is all from you, Lord. We come, we pray, and we worship and ask, Lord, of the things that we know that you'll give us. For it is in your loving, holy name this day, Lord. Amen. We bless Charles as he comes with his word tonight. Thank you, thank you. We're going to go ahead and get into the word. It's going to be Luke chapter 1. So if you want to turn in your Bible or on your phone, uh, we don't have it on the screen today. So sorry. <laughs> um, not my fault. It's mom's. Blame it on her. <laughs> just playing. Just playing. It's, it's my fault. But uh, Luke chapter 1, we're going to be reading uh, verse 57. And we're actually going to be finishing up the first chapter. So Luke chapter 1, 57. It says, When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Today, I want to call my uh, sermon, the, and I, was, I thought this was kind of fun, Certainty of the Story, The Birth of the Baptist. I was, uh, at, at, tomorrow morning, I, I didn't have the guts to put that in the bulletin, so I said, The Birth of John the Baptist. But, 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 
But I put the birth of the Baptist. <laughs> Last week, we talked about Mary's song. Um, you know, what's amazing about it is the fact that uh, the blessing that the Lord gave her, she wrote about it. She recorded it, her praise. She said, the generations will know that I'm blessed. And last week I challenged us to say that, you know, we're to be like the scribes. Because the scribe is a very, very, very important position. In fact, I would argue the most important position in all history. Because they're the ones who continue the story. They write the story. They're the ones who preserve the story. And so today, you as Christians, born-again believers, that you are the ones that are actually preserving God's Word. The, one, the message that's 2,000 years old is preserved through you today. And you have to share the story. You have to share the message. You have to tell people. You have to write things down. I challenge you, know, whenever you, whenever you encounter something that's interesting to you, you need to write it down. Because if we're not studying the Word, if we're not writing down things that the Spirit may be revealing to us, because one of the things you'll see in Luke is that people get filled with the Holy Spirit. You see it in Acts, too. People get filled with the Holy Spirit. When people get filled with the Holy Spirit, you really need to pay attention. Because that means God's inspiring them to do something, to say something from the Spirit, from, from the Spirit of God. Yes, it is not like the Spirit of God is programming them like robots to say exactly the way that He would say it. But it's using that particular person, that particular person's personality, that particular person's experience, and the Holy Spirit is filling them to give us a message. It's so amazing. And so Mary was filled with the Spirit. And so, or, and so she, was giving, she was recording this blessing that she had. So now today we're talking about the birth of the Baptist. We're talking about John the Baptist in verse 57. Elizabeth, so we know Zechariah. Zechariah, he got told he was going in the temple. He gets in the, this place, the burning of incense, at the altar of burning of incense. And he sees this angel, Gabriel. And Gabriel says that you are going to give birth to a son. You, you and your wife, you guys are going to conceive. And what's kind of crazy is the fact they were older. They were a little more seasoned, to put it politically correct. Seasoned folks. And it was impossible. Basically, really, it was impossible for them to conceive, to have a child. But... God is a God of the impossible. Amen. God does things that we can't, we can't fathom. God does the unimaginable. And so now, through his disbelief, see, I, I kind of made a comparison earlier that Mary, Mary, her, dis, her, her doubt was more of a mechanical thing. I, I don't understand exactly what it's going to look like. I have a hard time seeing how it's possible. I'm a virgin. Zechariah's doubt was more of a doubt of impossibility, saying, no, God can't do that. Mary was confused, didn't exactly know what it was going to look like, needed an explanation. Zechariah pretty much already wrote it off, did not give it time of day. Zechariah gets his mouth shut up, becomes dumb, cannot speak. And so this is a really interesting story. So we're going to look back at verse 57. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we just go verse by verse and... Um, and so we're going, to get, we're going to try getting through the rest of this chapter. So verse 57, When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave uh, birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord uh, uh, had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. So in 57, it was that time for Elizabeth to have her baby. Um, and then she gave birth to a son. So s some more time passes since where we were last week. Last week, we had Mary and Elizabeth. They meet together. And so now... Um, about three months has passed. There's been about three months. She gave birth to a son. Everyone is excited for her. Verse 58. Everyone's excited. They say, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy, and they shared her joy. They were excited. They thought, this is awesome. This is amazing. This has to be from God. This has to be from God. This is so amazing. Um, so she gives birth to this son. Verse 59. It says that... Uh, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. So, uh, on the eighth day, uh, circumcision was, a, that was, that's how it's always been with the Hebrew culture and the Jewish culture. On the eighth day, the boys get circumcised. And so, uh, it was custom for the Hebrews, uh, Hebrew boys, and these guys uh, know Zechariah. Now, remember, Zechariah is a priest. He's a, he's a priestly figure. So, he's known. So, of course, he's going to go through with all the customs, but he's also known. 
He is known. So like in verse 59, it says that, and they were going to name him after his father Zechariah. They just went ahead and was going to name him because, man, they know him. They know who he is. They also know that he hasn't had a child. They know that he has, his wife has been barren. They have not been able to. And so they went ahead and said, you know what, this has got to be exciting for Zechariah. Zechariah Jr., here he is. You know, they go ahead and write his name down. But then, verse 60, it says, But his mother spoke, John the Baptist, mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. So the mother, she steps in, Elizabeth, she steps in and says, No, no, no. You know, you, you think about a lot of times, you know, uh, tendency is, at least, you know, well, majority of culture is, you know, men want uh, a family name. They want uh, maybe their own name or some type of family name to be uh, carried down. And maybe he liked the idea, and but maybe he knew, I don't know for sure, because we see kind of later on what's going to happen, but of course he couldn't speak. Remember, he can't speak. So Elizabeth says, no, 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 he's going to be called John. His name is going to be John. And they said, John? They asked, John, what John? Who would name their kid John? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but, but they said, what? Why in the world would you name John? Because in verse, verse 61, they said, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. So John, it's a good name. But, but in his family, <laughs> in his family, though, there was no one with that name. Verse 61, it says, it says that they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. And so they asked Zechariah about this. They say, okay, well, Elizabeth said this, but let's talk to the, let's talk to the man of the household. That's kind of what they did, you know. We, we heard Elizabeth, but, you know, you know, what do you think, Zechariah? And it's awesome what he says, verse 62. It says, then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet. You know, he said, okay. <laughs> and then it's so cool uh, it says he asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment he wrote his name is John simple as that his name is John his name is John man Zechariah saw God work God Zechariah saw uh, God do this mighty work because what Zechariah considered impossible, God did. So Zechariah, he's not concerned about the name. He doesn't care about the name. He said, you know what? God bless me. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to claim the blessing and call it what it is. I'm going to claim the blessing. You know what John means? It means God is gracious. It means God is gracious. God has been gracious to Zechariah and Elizabeth. First of all, for allowing them breath in their lungs. But in the temple, for instance, uh, early on in the temple, uh, Zechariah was guilty of a, of a doubt of impossibility with God. But you know what's amazing? If you're in the presence of God, you're in the altar of incense, you're in the temple, you know, remember, remember this is a scary place. You know, if you're caught in sin in the Holy of Holies, you're struck dead. Remember that, right? They, they, have the, they put a rope around someone's ankle so they can pull him out if they were caught up in sin. But you know what's awesome? Is that God did not strike him down right then. Just silenced him. Being in the presence of God. Being in the presence of an angel. And then God allows him. Does not, does not force him. Does not strike him down. But he's just silenced, but he's not killed. He's silenced, but not killed. He was an old man, but he received a son. He received a blessing. Because you know back in this time, you know anyone who's, who's read a little bit of the Bible, you know having children was a big deal. If someone had a child, that means they were blessed, favored. They had, they had the blessing of the Lord. If they couldn't have a child, then it, it made them question their own value, who they were. God was so gracious to Zechariah. And so Zechariah now, nine months later, he's realized how blessed he is, how gracious God is, and that's what he does. He claims the blessing. He claims the blessing by name. Have you claimed your blessing today? Have you claimed the blessing? Now, what do I mean by that? Have you, you know, many of us can know the answers, right? You can know you're redeemed. You can know you're forgiven. You can know that, that you're blessed. 
Or you can know that you're talented. You can know about your age. But have you claimed it as being a gift from God? Have you claimed it as being God's provision? You know what? There's a strength to every single part of, of how God allowed you to be where you are today. For instance, like I said, uh, you, you know, age. People will say, well, I'm too young, too old. I can't do this. It's a blessing. Have you claimed the fact that, you know what, you're exactly the way you need to be right now? If you're 69 years old, Wayne, if, <laughs> if you're 69 years old, then that means that it is a intentional reason why God has allowed you to be there. If you are three months old, Sophia's not here, but if you're three months old, that means that God has has a reason why you're three months old. If right now, you know, you you look at yourself and you think, oh my goodness, I'm just, I'm just, I look at the mirror and I don't see the same person anymore. Oh goodness, who's that? Don't you, don't you allow the devil to convince you that you're, you're no longer in the image of God anymore. Don't allow the devil to say, you know what, no, no, you've aged out. You've, you got wrinkled. You got, you got this, you got this, you gained too much weight. You should hate yourself. That's what the devil wants you to think. That's what the devil wants you to think. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Have you claimed the fact that you are exactly who God created you to be right now in this place, in the moment? Uh, yeah, we, of course, can always have responsibility. You know, we can try eating better. We can eat, uh, you know, a little healthier. We can exercise, all that kind of stuff. But you have to make a... It's not that you're going to guilt and shame yourself into healthier living. No, you have to accept what God has put on your plate as a human being and what your appearance is and who you are, whatever it could be. But I, I, I'm going to go deeper than this, okay? You're forgiven. Have you claimed being forgiven? If you're, if you're forgiven, if you're forgiven, okay. Say today, you and I, all of us, we go, we go to uh, court. And, and we, we have all, um, someone dug up and found that every single one of us was guilty of like a million parking tickets. Big, big fine. Huge fine, because there's just a bunch of them. And in fact, actually, it's so bad that, um, that you know, you're sentenced to prison immediately. I mean, like, you, you can't afford it. You know there's no hope in it. And you just know that, that you are sentenced to a lifetime in prison. But then somebody says, okay, for this, I mean, just think about it. Think about a crime. I mean, you can do a, a bad crime, but I just, you know, I'm not trying to accuse anybody of anything. So, but, but you can have this terrible crime. And you're in this place with the judge. You're in the court. And the judge says that your fine has been paid. That you're free to go. And you know for a fact before all that, you know. You, in fact, you've seen some of your friends go. And those friends are in prison. Those friends that you, you knew, you know, they're, they're in prison and they're there. And you know they're not getting out. You know there's no chance of parole, nothing. And then you stand before the judge and that judge says, you know what, you are forgiven your debt. Well, I don't think that I don't. I really don't think that the your response would be. I'm just not going to tell anybody about it. I'm just not going to do anything about it. I'm just going to go on back home and keep it quiet. I'm definitely not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to share anything. I'm not going to do anything. As a falsehood, you'd be stoked. You'd be so excited that you knew that your life was saved because your debt had been paid. Have you grabbed on to the fact that you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ? That you are redeemed that you are made anew that you're forgiven because i'll be honest with you i don't think that i don't think that any of us really live like we've claimed being forgiven totally i mean i i think that we we work we, we try to work towards it but we have to claim the blessing for what it is we have to claim it because oftentimes we forget about it we neglect it we think okay you know got saved a long time ago and, and, and then you say to yourself man i haven't really grown in my relationship with god no i haven't really but because you ha you're not thinking about it in terms of claiming the blessing. God has already set a whole table of blessing for you, but the problem is that we tend to just look at the table. And we say, okay, that's nice. You know, I'm forgiven. Okay, I'm blessed. You know, I got a house. I got a family. I've got a life. I got a job. And it's like a nice thing. You know, it's something to be thankful for. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is nice. I get to see it. But have you claimed it? The claiming is saying, hey, you know what? Yes, this is my... I mean, this is part of who I... This is... This is this is something I grab onto that is what I go forward with. 
This is something that I go forward with. You know, maybe you have a talent. You know, a lot of times in Christian culture, we just really value being humble. Really value being humble to the point where we're shameful. Where, you know what, we don't want to admit that we're good at something. We don't want to admit that we have the ability to do something. We don't want to admit certain uh, strengths and weaknesses that we have. Because what happens is we haven't grabbed the fact that God gave us talents. You know what happens if we don't uh, grab it and use talents we give it to us and we just bury it in the ground Well, we don't get the blessing? Right? If we just bury it in the ground, then we, we, we don't get the blessing. If we just leave it on the table. We leave all the blessings that we have on this metaphorical table that I'm talking about. We just leave it there. You're not going to get the blessing. You may, you may have it. It's available to you. But you don't claim it. You have to claim it. See, Zechariah, he lived a lifestyle of knowing God. Being a righteous man, Luke says in chapter 1, earlier in the, in the chapter, he says that Luke was a righteous man before God. He was a forgiven man before God, but he did not live like it. He did not claim the truth at that point. But now he has seen nine months of being silent helped him really understand some things. And one of those things is the fact that that boy's name is going to be John because God is gracious. He, he wrote it down. He claimed it. And that is the truth. So he claimed that. So verse 65, it says, all throughout, it says, all throughout, all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Who is this child going to be? This, this can't be happening by accident. Who is this child going to be? I'm going to come back to that question in just a minute, but I'm going to keep going forward in verse 67. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So this is something I always say to look out for. When you, when you see one of God's people be filled with the Holy Spirit, this is one of those things you've got to look out for. What does, they, what does he say? What is God inspiring him to say? It says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because He has come to His people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us and the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Now, this right here, I would not, I promise you, I would have kept reading. Would have kept reading, and I wouldn't have paused here had it not been for Sophia two days ago. I was reading this to her. As I do, I, I, I try to read stuff to her, especially if I'm behind on some studies, I'll, I'll be reading to her some of this word. And I remember, she, I remember I was thinking, okay, well, that's a pretty good place to stop, but I'll just keep going. But then she started crying. After I, after I kept going, I said, okay, all right, message taken. Okay, so there's, this, this is important. So, what was covered in this point? What, are, what, is, what is Zachariah saying? He says, praise God. He says, praise God for His faithfulness. He says that He's a Redeemer. He warned us through the prophets. He kept His promises. He rescues us from His enemies. And, and I love this ending here. He enables us to serve without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all of our days. Are we, have we claimed the salvation of God? Have we claimed the equipping of God as a blessing in our own lives? Have we claimed it? Because if we claim it, oh, we don't have to have fear. We don't have to have fear. We can be in holiness and righteousness and we can be before Him all of our days. We don't have to be in fear. The Christian faith doesn't have to be in fear. You don't have to be in fear if you're going to make the right or the wrong move. What you have to do is yield to God. You have to submit to the Lordship of Christ. Now we, because of all this, because of God's faithfulness and His goodness, it has all come together to the fact that one day, one day there's going to be a group of people sitting in here on a December night and on a Saturday night in, a, in the United States of America at a place called The Story that can come out of these doors and ha not have no fear because you know God is with you. Because you know God has redeemed you. Because you know that God has forgiven you. Because you know God has kept His promises. Because you know that He rescues you from your enemies. 
You feel like you're dealing with spiritual warfare? There are no enemies that can come even close to the presence of God Almighty. There is nothing that can beat the presence of God. He enables us to serve without fear. He gives us the strength. He gives us the victory. We have a victorious life in Christ. We don't need to think, oh man, you know, we're just here to sit it out and, 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 and take the punches and be the punching bag of the world. No. The ones who pursued after God and His righteousness were blessed beyond measure. You know, I'll bring it up again. Why not? Daniel, in the book of Daniel, that man prospered. Joseph, he was sold into slavery, but man, he prospered because he served the Lord. Because he served the Lord without fear. He feared God and he respected God's ways. God does not have an intention for you just to fall into a pit and to be miserable and to just be in the pits all the time. No, he wants you to live victoriously. Why? Because he won the victory. Have you claimed the victory? Have you claimed the victory? Verse 76. Now he's talking to his child, talking to John. This is his message to John. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for Him, to give His people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is Zachariah's blessing to this child named John. This blessing, John the Baptist, well, first of all, he wasn't known as a Baptist yet. <laughs> John was a little baby. He didn't probably comprehend the words being spoken then. He probably didn't think to himself, oh man, wow, okay, that's what, that's what Dad said I was going to be. Here's the thing. The promises, the commitments, the claims that you make today that you may forget about one day. God doesn't forget. God doesn't forget. The prayer that you have for your family, for your children, for your children's children, man, we got to think generationally. Man, there's generational blessings if you pray for it and you say, Lord, protect my family, be with my family. Draw them to repentance. Draw them to be who you called them to be. Zechariah spoke the words into existence. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I read this, I think to myself, man, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. So I just want to share with you a little bit about this with, from what the Lord was doing with my heart. So I know that many of us look at the word prophet and we think, oh, I, don't, I don't know about that confusing. So for sake of time, I'm just going to say let's replace the word prophet with disciple, okay? Let's replace the word prophet with disciple in this just this example. Because I do believe that prophetic ability is given to the church, but that's really us pointing to God's Word more so than like a new revelation. I don't believe there's any new revelation, but I do believe there is the consistent revelation given to us in the Bible. But, to make it simplified, we are all called to be disciples. So, if we read this, And you, my child, this is, the, this is God talking, And you, my child, will be called a disciple of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord and prepare the way for Him to give His people the knowledge of salvation. Whoa! That's what we're called to do today. Folks, we're, called, we're not called to save people. We're supposed to give them the knowledge of salvation. Whoa! We're called to tell people about there's this guy named Jesus and he saved my life. We're called to tell people about this reckless love that's just so crazy and so mind-blowing. We're called to tell people about this great love of salvation. And through the forgiveness of their sins, in verse 77, because of the tender mercy of our God, it's not because of you, it's not because of me, but because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness. You seeking out the Lord and being obedient to Him and loving Him and having a relationship with Him, if you are really claiming the salvation that Jesus gave you all, if you decided for yourself that you wanted to follow Jesus, you're like a light 
For those in the darkness, you are like a light. People will see, and then they'll see in the shadow of death to guide the feet into the path of peace. What's the path of peace? It's salvation under Christ. Today, we are in a time where we can lead others to Jesus. We know this is, the Christ, this is part of the Christmas story. This is John the Baptist getting born. We know that. But the truth is, is that this message can also be for us today. And how the fact that we are called to be the ones to go out. And, and you know what? You are commissioned by the Most High. You are commissioned by the Almighty Jesus Christ to go out and make disciples. And you know what's amazing is the fact that, you know what? It really, I love this in the language, if you really study it. It's like, as you're going... So it's not like you really just have to totally change your regiment, but in the middle of your regiment, who are you discipling? Who are you making the decision? Who, who, who are you teaching the knowledge of Jesus Christ to? We may, may, may not be a prophet, but we are disciples. Verse 80. It says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. John officially is introduced here. And so I'm going to go back to the question, what is this child going to be? Uh, the question that they asked, Zechariah, what is this child going to be? So there's got to be something. There's got to be some meaning here. What is this child going to be? And the answer is exactly what Zechariah spoke and claimed that he would be. Exactly what Zechariah claimed he would be, John became that. In John chapter 3, verse 30, John the Baptist spoke about this. He, this is the word he said. He says, he must become greater. Talking about Jesus. John the Baptist, as an adult man, he says, he must become greater and I must become less. The King James says, he must increase and I must decrease. You want to claim your blessing today? You want to claim your blessing? Claim that the fact that you can be an evangelist? Claim the, the, the free future? You want to claim the, the, the difficulty? The, the, you want to claim freedom through the difficulty that you're dealing with? The, 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 the financial issues that you may be going through? The family problems? The spiritual problems? The sin problems? You want to claim freedom from all that? What must you do? You must claim it. But how do you claim it? The claim? How do you do that? He must increase. You must decrease. What in your life do you need to decrease? What do you need to deny? You know, the Bible says, deny yourself. If you claim a blessing, if you claim a blessing, and you really believe it, and you're claiming that, and you're living your life because you're claiming that, you're going to deny yourself. You're no longer going to put yourself in charge. If God has set us forward at this table, you know, the thing about Psalm 23. He puts us in this, this table. You, you prepare me in the presence of my enemies. With all this, and what's amazing is the fact that all these blessings that you can have right in front of you, all these blessings, all of it, you can claim it for yourself, but the only way you're actually going to claim it is if you deny yourself, if you die to yourself. We need to die to ourselves. It's interesting is that Christ died for all. Christ died.